Hello and welcome, dear viewer. Now, as this is my first YouTube review video, I want to immediately apologize for four things. First, my microphone is probably not set up correctly. Second, English is not my first language, so excuse any language and pronunciation mistakes I make. Third, I am not a professional at anything I say or do in this video, so don't take me too seriously. I'm just a random guy on the internet interested in this stuff, nothing more. And finally, this video is very much explained like I'm five. I just want to make sure that there's almost no preliminary knowledge required to follow along. Without other way, let's begin. So if you're developing a conlang, which I assume you are as you clicked on this video, you might have come up with a writing system or a script to be used in while writing down your language. There are a lot of videos about doing exactly that out there, so I will not talk about the creation process at all. But it appears to me that all of these people seem to miss an important technical detail about conlang scripts. You see, if you have fully developed your script, it probably exists in handwritten form as digital images possibly created with a drawing program or even both. And yes, these images or scans of your handwriting might be useful to show your reader what your script looks like, how it works and how it can be organized and memorized. For example, to learn the Japanese scripts, I do not only need to know how the characters look, but what the stroke order and direction is to reproduce them correctly and efficiently. But yet when you want to create larger blocks of text in your script or even just a couple of sample sentences, it becomes very tedious very quickly to always assemble dozens or even hundreds of images and align them properly. And always using your romanization scheme. If you don't have one, stop right now and go create one, I dare you. It's just a bit boring after all. It's meant mainly for learning the characters, their pronunciation and so on. So finally getting to the point of this video, I want to show you a very efficient way of making a digital version of your script that can efficiently and beautifully be used in documents. Now, the next part will contain an introduction to fonts, vector graphics, Unicode and the private use area. You will see time codes on the screen right now to skip to any part you need or to jump right after the explanations. If you used a computer at any point in the last decades, you will probably have heard about fonts. A font is a file that tells any program displaying text how that text should look like. For instance, you are right now looking at a text using the Kandara font. So every font essentially tells the program, this is what an A should look like and this is what a B sh should look like, and so on. In practice, it's a bit more complicated than that, but <laughs> that's essentially it. The program takes these images for A, B, C, and so on, and assembles them into a readable stream of images. Now, you might also know that computers don't understand text by default. All they do understand is numbers, 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 numbers. So to store any text at all, you have to convert it to numbers by telling the computer, the A is stored as this number, the B is stored as this other number, and the C is stored as yet another number, and so on. This allows the computer to deal with this text as a giant list of numbers that can be stored, modified, typed in by the user and displayed on a screen using a font, as I just told you. But the question is, which numbers do we actually use for each letter? After all, we have to agree on which number is which character or everything turns into chaos. There have been a number of ways we did that in the past, but the most universal and widespread one today is Unicode. This is a standard of turning basically any character symbol and special marking of any language that exists or has existed into one of several thousand of possible numbers. And yes, this means that the Latin alphabet gets its own numbers, as well as the Arabic script, the Quranic alphabet and basically every Chinese character and all the others as well. The issue, of course, is your script is a new invention. It is not part of the Unicode standard. So what should we do to encode your script as numbers without confusing the computer? The great thing is that there are several collections of numbers, the so-called private use areas, which will never be assigned anything by the Unicode consortium, the guys who invent and change Unicode. These areas are essentially the perfect fit. Now you can go and assign each character in your script a number inside the private use areas. I recommend these lower blocks as they will actually consume less storage space than these upper ones. It's a bit complicated here. We're not done yet, not by far. Your computer can now store your script and modify it, but how does it know how to display it? By this point, your characters will probably appear as these rectangle boxes, which stand for character not found. But we previously learned that it is the job of a font to decide which characters to display in what manner. 
And surprise, surprise, fonts use Unicode as well and assign each Unicode number and image. So the next logical step is to create our own font that tells the computer how to display these weird characters inside the private use area that we decided to represent characters in our script. If we had a character X, for example, and assigned it the number 57,345, which is part of the very first private use area, we have to make a font where the number 57,345 refers to an image of our character X. To make our font, we will need a special program, and I will be using the freeware bird font for that, as it allows you to create any fonts that you don't want to use commercially. So be aware that all your fonts you create must accord to the SIL open font license, which is essentially an open source license for fonts. Download and install version from the official website, I won't explain that, and open it up. For this tutorial, I will actually use a conlang script of my own just for showcasing advanced features. Now, this will not be a full bird font tutorial, I don't have the time for that, but I will show you the basics to get you started. You should start up in the overview tab, but if you don't, you can open it up from the top right menu bar. The overview presents you with a collection of character sets from which you can select the character to edit. The default one contains a Latin alphabet plus some punctuation and numbers, but we don't need that. To create a character from the rather out there private use areas, click on the U plus symbol on the left. You should now be able to enter the hexadecimal number of the character you want to create and click add. The hexadecimal number is this strange other number format that is seen with the U plus in front of it in Unicode. You can use the official Unicode tables to look up which of these lie in the private use area. Now, if you did everything right, you should now enter a character edit tab, which has no description on top because Birdfront, of course, doesn't know about your new special characters. Before we continue, let me tell you that this edit screen looks quite different from the one you might encounter in Paint or something. This is due to fonts being in vector graphic format. Vector graphics are not made up out of pixels, but of paths and shapes described in an abstract way. The great advantage of such shapes is that you can zoom in infinitely on them and they will always have sharp edges because the computer calculates the actual pixels on the fly out of these shapes, lines and colors. So here you will actually be creating lines and curves and telling them to be filled with a color or have an outline of certain strength. If you ever used Illustrator or Inkscape, this is your time to shine because most stuff directly translates to here. With the major exception being that fonts and their characters are entirely monochrome or having only one color. There's a feature in BirdFont to create multicolor fonts for emoji or whatever, but I have never used it and generally recommend sticking with monochrome, which is best for any script and allows your text to be recolored later. I will not go over the details of how the screen works. Luckily, most of the features are self-explanatory. There's a feature to add backgrounds, very useful for translating your handwritten characters into these vector graphics. But there are some things special to fonts that need mentioning. These five movable lines here are the character position and spacing markers. This one denotes the top of the line and is global to all characters in your font, so be careful when you move it. If your characters are rather flat, you can move it down to indicate that the space to the line of text above doesn't need to be that large. The same goes for the two button lines. They apply to all characters. This is the baseline or the line that your characters will sit on. You should move your characters to start right at or just above the baseline. The lower one denotes the gap between the baseline and the next line below it. As you might have characters that extend below your baseline, it's important that they still reside above the line gap or else they might intersect with the next line below. The last two lines to the right and left of your characters are separate for each character you create, so play around with them. They indicate the actual beginning and end of your character. Imagine the characters to be inside these boxes that are placed with pinpoint accuracy next to each other. So make sure you leave enough and consistent spacing to the right and left of each character. While you are busy creating all your amazing characters, you can always look at all defined characters in the topmost character set in the overview tab. This is an easy way to revisit characters if they need to be changed later. Just double click on any of the preview icons. After the individual creation is done, it is important to visit the spacing and kerning tab. In the spacing tab, you can insert characters. It is best to use this button for that purpose and preview your font and script for the first time. But more importantly, change the spacing of the characters to the left and right with these arrows or these text input fields. Remember the two vertical lines in the character edit tab? Yeah, these are exactly the same. Make sure that all characters have consistent spacing and check the readability of your script at different sizes using this slider. Now to the last tab. I want to discuss in detail the kerning tab. Oh my god, the kerning tab. 
Essentially, in typography, kerning is the distance of two distinct characters to each other, which means that you can adjust how every single character looks behind and in front of every single other character, including itself. This is not absolutely necessary, but if you want to be sure about your character spacing, at least check every character combination. After all, you can do some very cool things with this. Before we continue with exporting, installing and using a font, I might want to mention a couple of extra things that are possible. If you want to use an external editor, you can import SVG vector graphics into bird font for individual characters. Ligatures are a way of defining a combined form for two or more characters following each other. The most prominent example for this is probably FI, where a ligature is often used to combine the dot of the I into the F. Sadly, I have not been able to get ligatures working in bird font, so refer to the official documentation or other tutorials if you want to know more. Contextual forms allow you to define multiple versions of a character depending on the surrounding beginning and middle isolated and probably a couple more. This feature is intended for Arabic scripts, but you can uh, use it to great effect if you want to have similar characteristics in your script. Finally, we're here. Now the last thing to do is go into name and description and imp input all the important information. When you're done for real, visit the export settings and check all the formats you want your font to be exported into. Click export and wait for this icon to return to normal. You're done. The finished font files should appear in the same folder as your .bird font file. Now on to installing your font. This should be very simple, you just install your font like any other. The process differs from each operating system, but for Windows, double click on the normal TTF file, click install and confirm deletion if you have an older version of your font still installed. Just search for font installation on your operating system if you're using iOS or any Linux distribution. Open up any word processing software, I'm gonna use Word here, and check that your font is available in the font selection screen. You could theoretically now use your font to write text, but you have probably used the private use area, so there is no quick way of entering characters from there over your keyboard. On Windows, there's the Alt Numpad option, but that one's hacky and requires you to remember the number of every character. So instead, we will use the Insert Symbol feature that every word processor has. The handy feature of both the Word and LibreOffice dialogs is that if you select your newly created font up there, only the characters defined in that font will show up. So all that should be visible here are your special characters from your script. Now simply insert the characters you need at the place in the document you need them to be. If some things about your font are off, for example spacing or the size of a character, you can go back to bird font, change it, export and install the font again. The characters in your word processor should update immediately, but sometimes it is necessary to restart it after you reinstall the font. Before I go, two extra notes. If you need your document to be accessible to other people as well, don't forget to enable font embedding in the settings. Again, this depends on your word processor and the file format. Font embedding essentially includes your font with the document itself so anyone can read it correctly without installing the font beforehand. And finally, at least Word allows you to define special key combinations to insert a character of a specific font. You can use that to make a quick and handy way to insert any of your script's characters. Anyways, that's all for today and I hope you found this guide slash tutorial useful. I don't really have any social media, so my only hope is that you like this video or even subscribe to me. I don't know whether or when I will make another video, but until next time, goodbye.